It's just, just a question about King Lear. Uh, I find myself agreeing with all sorts of fascinating things in your talk, which is really good, thank you. Um, but at the end of the play, there is some very worrying verdicts delivered um, about what's been going on. Like Edgar says about why Edwin is behaving like this, that it was his father's fault, Gloucester's fault, and that the gods are just, and of our pleasant vices have made this kind of instruments to torture. <laughs> so there's a, it seems to be a sort of pagan view of the play. Now, you could say, okay, well, that's not Shakespeare's view, but there don't seem to be any contrary voices to that, that I can hear in the play. And, and there's a very strange bit, which I can never explain to my students, which is, why does Edgar spend all this time torturing his father at the end? It seems to be some sort of learning process, you know, when he sort of pretends to take him to the brow of the hill <coughs> and throw him over, to, to bring him out of desolation, perhaps. But it just seems to be peculiarly torturing, because then he never tells him who he is, I mean, he doesn't reveal his identity, until he dies. So, I kind of, what would you have a comment on that? It's difficult, it seems to me, to, to reconcile, to look for consistency. Um, theological or re religious consistency. It's, I mean, what, in, in, the, in the ending of Lear, and, and there are so many different, so many different uh, versions about that, and so many different views about that. Um, I don't really have I don't really have an answer to your question, um, and I, as I say, I, you know, this is a it's something I'm working on from time to time, and I haven't um, haven't looked at the the kind of the dramatic side or the character side of the of the play for some time. Um, well, it seems to me it, is that Shakespeare transfers. Sets up a kind of a pagan religion, um, pagan religious context, but then injects elements of Christian Christian theology or Christian um, thinking in that, but without any kind of sense of, of consistency or it seems not looking for theological consistency, but what works for the drama, and that seems to me to to bring up. Um, inconsistencies and, and, uh, and difficulties which, which I don't know how to reconcile. So I'm really, I, I don't have an answer. The real strength, it seems to me, at the end of that play is compassion and is pity. And even though compassion and pity dies, as indeed, you know, on Calvary, compassion and pity also died, it has a strength in itself. I mean, if, if the real dilemma or the real question at the end is, well, would you rather die like Goneril and Regan or would you rather die like Cordelia? I think I'd rather die like Cordelia, at least having, having had a level of integrity and achieved something in, my, in the acting out of my virtue, which intrinsically in and of itself is, is, is morally better. Than, than anything else that's around me, even though I may not survive, even though it doesn't actually, it doesn't all come right in the end. And it seems to me that the finding of God in all things, among other things, is to say, finding God in all things is not just about, well, making everything nice, because life isn't always nice. and. Things don't always survive. I mean, the fact is, Mary Ward died during the English Civil War with her entire life's work in ruins. And, you know, the order kind of survived just about, but I mean, she herself wasn't in any way rehabilitated for 300 years. But there was a value in what she did and what she was that completely overwhelms the stupidity of the people who were in charge of the church at the time. And maybe that's, and you know, Etty Hillisom. Who remembers who killed Etty? Nobody. Nobody knows who they were. But people know who Etty was, even though she died. Because actually, what was within Etty was so much more powerful than any of the evil 
that was done to her, even though she was overwhelmed with evil and there was no last minute rescue. And it seems to me that, you know, um, Albert Camus uh, in, his, in his work about Sisyphus says at the end, il faut imaginer Sisyphe heureux. We've got to imagine that Sisyphus was happy. <laughs> well, that's, that's, you know, existentialism for you. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, I think. Well, I, would, I would just say that, um, I mean, the, the, I, one of the things that I see in common with Rahner and um, Sixu and Hillisum is, is that um, attention to the concrete. And, you know, that uh, Eddie mentions, you know, she has these flowers on her desk. You know, she notices the tree in bloom outside of her window. Um, you know, Sixu notices similar kinds of things. And, um, you know, I just, I find it so remarkable that Hillison was able to remain, she was always joy, she remained joyful in, you know, while she was existing in hell. And it's just the most, I find that the most remarkable thing. And she could have escaped. I mean, she, she could have been saved. And instead she chose to go to Auschwitz with her family and friends. And apparently from letters that were written and people who, um, heard about it, she w remained joyful to the end and also spread that joy to the others who were around her in the camp. So, I mean, that's, I find that just quite remarkable. And I find something, you know, really quite Ignatian about it, that it's a very fragile thing. I, I think sanctity doesn't depend on getting rescued. <laughs> you know. Um, so, so we have to, I think, we have to negotiate what we understand by virtue, irrespective of virtue's fate. But what we need, to, I think, and Christ himself tells us, you know, we need to look at virtue's fruits. And virtue's fruits are more important in the end, I think, than virtue's fate. Though it's easy for me to sit here and say that. Coming back to Leah, too, I think um, I with all kinds of plays and, and novels and things, I often look for a, for a kind of subconsciously looking for a poetic justice where the evil deserve, evil get the reward they deserve and, and the good get the reward that they deserve. And life again is, is not like that. Um, so I think we can, you can come to Lear expecting that that, that will happen and it doesn't. And so we're disappointed, yet why are we disappointed? Um, because it's a, it's a tragedy and that's how, that's how tragedies are. Um, there, isn't a, there isn't a kind of a rational, a, a rational explanation or a, 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 just, a justice at work in the world of the tragedy, which we expect sometimes. Just from what you just said there, it's very fragile. Um, what sort of a world am I bequeathing to my children who are in their 20s? Do I say that to them? It's fine for me, in one sense, because, you know, one reaches an age where one can be, so to speak, reconciled to relatively little. Um, what sort of hope are we giving, if that's what it's about, to the next generation or my grandchildren's generation? Is that it? Is that, is that our bequest to and is that enough? I find that a very difficult question. I mean, it's something I think about often. Well, because I, you know, my I have a daughter who's in her thirties, and the students that I teach, you know, I worry about what the future will be for them. Um, and and a lot of them are very sheltered. You know, they don't really have a sense of um, tragedy. Um, but I, on the other hand, I do see a, some, a lot of hopeful things among the young people. Um, you know, a lot of political activism that's also very creative, a lot of interesting sort of political theater and artwork that's done, and um, even in the new kinds of media on, you know, on Twitter and with, their, with the um, games that they create. Um, the way that they communicate, the way that they're living, choosing to live together, you know, in groups, much different from the nuclear family. I mean, 
I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting things going on with the young people and that they themselves, I find a lot of hope looking at them because they didn't vote for um, Trump or, you know, they don't seem to want what's happening. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, as they grow older to see what, you know, how they're resisting on a huge scale. Um, I don't know if how much it shows, you know, how much it's covered in the news, but every single day there's huge protests and um, all kinds of conversations going on. So I find, you know, the youth themselves um, to be hopeful, signs of hope. Not so much a question as a response to the previous question, what hope for the children. But when I was a child in the 50s and 60s, we learned catechism in school. And the Catechism had a question, why is there a need for a general judgment? And the answer was, there is need for a general judgment so that the providence of God, which in this world allows the wicked to prosper and the innocent to suffer, may be revealed to all men and women. There's an essay in an early, an, an early collection of his about um, where do you find the spirit? Mm. And, um, yeah. and it's, he, he gives a number of instances where he says that this is where, this is where we find, where, this is where we experience the spirit. And all of them are instances of brokenness. Yeah. They're all instances of failure and brokenness. And um, he talks about the man whose moral, um, whose moral calculus, moral balance sheet doesn't add up. He can't make it balance. Um, someone who can't, you know, just, they're all, they're all images of brokenness. He says, that's where you find the spirit. That's where the spirit is at work in the world. Yeah.